It's fun that is the end. Fun isn't actually. Is the resurrection stuff at the end of all the fun? No. No. Oh, no. Okay. But you could stop there. If you were following the symbols up to this point, and if you're following the household symbol, which I'll which I'll go through in a sec, then that's enough, really. Um, but you know, <laughs> John's gone through multiple editions, we think, um, and it's, there's reasonable evidence that, as well as you know, uh, tightening it up and adding additional layers, there's also additional stuff for the dumb folks. So <laughs> if you didn't get it, we'll just add some additional bits at the end to kind of give it. There's a, there's a reasonable argument that chapter 15 is basically chapter 14. But with a bit more detail for the slow people. It's chapter fourteen for dummies. <laughs> yeah, that's right, pretty much. Which is a standard Greek philosophical move, and if you look at uh, the right at the end of uh, Republic, mm -hmm. there's been this extended sort of discussion of justice, and then all of a sudden Plato makes this weird right angle turn and tells this bizarre bizarre story about. The myth of Ur, where where Ur dies and you know he gets his little tour of the underworld and then he comes back, and right at the very end, Plato writes, uh, you know, Socrates says, uh, if you're convinced uh, by me, then you'll live a just life because you understand these things. But if you're convinced by the story, you'll live a good life because you're afraid of being punished and you want to have a good crossing. And he makes it absolutely explicit that there's two ways of of teaching the same lesson. And there's one for the people who are philosophically minded, and then I'll teach the, you know I'll tell this story for for those who are not terribly bright. So that's a standard standard move. So it's unsurprising that the same thing would show up. Yeah. <laughs> Connected tradition. So that's that's a really whistle stop tour of the of the temple thing. Um, and if it seemed a little sketchy, and you kind of well, I'm not completely convinced. Uh, yeah, there's another 150 pages of detail in there that kind of by the time you finish it, you go. Yeah, okay, fair enough. She's got a whole thing, which I'd love to go into, but there's not time. We're talking about the term, the Nazarene, which really only, I think, gets used once in the Gospel of John. It's used much more in the other, the other Gospels, but in the synoptics. Uh, but she connects it to the prediction in Zechariah of who the, who the builder of the temple will be, who will be the one who um, destroys and raises the temple. And he's referred to as the branch. And the term in Hebrew for branch is nitzer. Hmm. So uh, she goes to some <coughs> effort to kind of draw this big line around various uses of the term branch and the two different words branch and the way that shows up in Isaiah. Um, and to kind of say, so there's a... <laughs> you know, John doesn't make a big point that Jesus was from Nazareth, but at some point he's referred to as the Nazarene. In the, in the Passion narrative he's referred to as the Nazarene. So there's an argument that what, what the Gospel of John is getting at by pulling the term out of that point is to say, and, wink, builder of the temple, right? Because we've read Zechariah. Am I right? Okay. And, and then on we go. It's another one of those, wow, that's a really long bow, but I love where you're going. <laughs> so that's the temple thing. Any questions? Or are you, Ralph, you're a bit frowny? Oh, no. You know, I'm, I'm just putting myself in the mind of the time and thinking if, if you take a postmodern perspective what, how many stories or how few stories right, what we would think, how few stories have they really done you know, we might, you know, we might casually today throw in bits from Star Wars or you know, all sorts of things mm -hmm. so they will casually throw in bits from earlier ones whether it necessarily means Right. That it's the link they're making, right. or it's just because, you know... Or is it just in the background when you're writing, you know? And it's what? just the terminology. I mean, I think, you know, we talk, you know, you can talk about the philosophical tradition of, of getting a concept across by having a conversation where some people talk, mm. and one person doesn't like get it, mm -hmm. because that's... Or you can, you can think of that as being a philosophical approach, or, mm -hmm. or you can think of it as being a literary tool which they happen to know because they weren't that many books that they've read. Sure. And the ones that they've read used that tool and it worked, seemed to work pretty well. Sure. You know, we have PowerPoint. Right. Right. If it was written today, they mightn't have somebody they totally. that they talk to who doesn't get it, they would have some bullet points. So I, I guess, I guess the, so just to take the living water thing as, a, yeah. as an example, right? Because that that's another long bow, right? Yeah. But to, so to me, the way to, to kind of, the way mm. I kind of take that, for someone writing at that time, if they're well studied in scripture, mm. 
then when they're trying to look for a nice image to portray some aspect of what the ministry is about, so they've got that whole scriptural tradition behind, behind them. They're looking for, a, for, you know, living water. That's a beautiful, yeah, mm. we'll use that. Living water will say that. Without necessarily going, oh, yeah, that really connects to all that stuff in Ezekiel. Mm. But it's there as sort of tacit background mm. in the writing of the text. And for someone else reading it, that resonates with them. And it brings a particular connotative mm. kind of web with it yeah. that, that is communicative. Yeah. And the trouble is, we're not steeped in that scriptural tradition. And we don't have all that. So the gift that... Dr. Collo brings, I think, is, is she's not saying it's a didactic process of drawing these really strict links. Mm. She has to do that mm. in order to make take the tacit for them in the first mm. century and make it explicit for us and say, okay, so it's reasonable to suggest <laughs> that the field of association that's being summoned by that word is something about this stuff. Mm. And that's what's in there as a connotation for someone in the first century. I guess it's that sense of making the associations, but then reminding people they may just be casual associations. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And she's pretty thorough I about think that. that's that sense of... The, the kind of thing I was frowning really was like with the Nazarene. The author may have just said, he's the branch. Mm -hmm. And then in subsequent transcriptions... It just got... It became the Nazarene. Yeah. And if it's only the Nazarene is seriously only used once in the whole text, chances are it may have just been the branch. Maybe. Possib possibly. Maybe. Chances are, right? There's if some... it's more often than not, then the chances are higher that it's the Nazarene. That means right. the fewer it's used, the chances the are lower significant... that it's the right. Nazarene, the chances are higher that it's actually just the branch. And there's interpretive principles in, in yeah. the way yeah. one reads New Testament scripture Absolutely. these days where you, you look for those weird little details that seem like a strange inclusion. What, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what's that... Why is that there? Yeah. <laughs> well, we don't necessarily want to attribute that to a certain intentionality on the part of the author. No, not yeah, necessarily. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and Dr. Collar's quite thorough on that stuff. She right. kind of says, okay, so one could speculate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that the case? No idea. But wasn't that fun? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to press on. Um, conscious of the time. So the term, my father... Jesus refers to to God as my Father quite a lot through um, through the Gospel of John, and it's important to get a little clear and strict on on what he may be trying to get across when he says my Father. Standing in the twenty first century, um, after what now thirty or forty years of feminism, um, it's almost de rigueur to take a, a critique of patriarchy into any any look at biblical theology. Um, and to kind of reflect on what we know about how Roman households looked and the paterfamilias, you know, and that whole sense of the kind of authoritarian father ruling over the household, uh, and to kind of look at this and go, whoa, I don't want to live in my father's house, that's horrifying. Is that what Jesus means in the fourth gospel, is the question. Now, one of the most beautiful gifts, I think, Dr. Collar gives us in dwelling in the household of God is to really dig into what might be meant in the gospel itself and what might be meant in the first century Palestinian social environment by father and household. Does it mean what we fear it means? Does it simply mean what we'd like it to mean? <laughs> As we project our desires and expectations from here under there? Or does it mean something that has potential? And she paints a picture in which the third is the case. So the first thing is to look at the image of Father in the fourth gospel. Now, he, Jesus refers to God as my Father. He refers to the temple as my Father's house in the early part of the gospel. But what characterizes this father-son relationship that we're talking about? And Dr. Collo pulls out several themes. The first is the surrender of power. So Jesus never refers to God as telling him what to do. He never refers to God as being authoritarian, or of issuing instructions, or of being strict, or of being any kind of disciplinarian. He always uses phrases that refer to the surrender of power from father to son, the giving over of agency, the handing over of authority, the giving up of, not the holding. So that's the first thing. The second thing is there's lots of passages where he refers to the son can only do what the father has taught him, that kind of thing. Slaves don't learn, children do. So the second thing about the relationship, it's about the being drawn into a relationship of learning 
a relationship in which a certain kind of being is modelled. So there's the sense in which a son is apprenticed to his father. Now, if we hang out with the classical infancy narrative of Jesus and we hold that he was raised by a carpenter called Joseph, I can't think where he got this idea from. <laughs> and it's appropriate to point to that since we're in a Josephite convent, I think, but still. So in general, the relationship between father and son that's portrayed in the gospel isn't what we may fear <laughs> a father-son relationship might be like. And what many of us might carry as an assumption of that relationship from our own relationships with our fathers, it's a really deep relationship of intimacy and mutuality in which the connection between father and son is so deep that it's described as indwelling. So there's a deep intimacy there's a transcendent mutuality. It says, so I've got a couple of quotes there in the first, in the first chapter. In, in verse 13, children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or of a husband's will were born of God, it says of the people. And then in verse 18, no one has ever seen God but God the one and only who is at the Father's side and has made him known. So it's an intimate, it's a very intimate and close relationship between father and son. And it points out in John 13 that it's not just... So when we talk about the children of the Father, it's not the kin of... It's not merely the kin of the Father, born not of blood and not of a husband's will, but of everyone that, that decides to join in. So it's a voluntary family. It's a very wacky 21st century notion in a way, right? But the household considered in this way... And this is a Palestinian... This is a first century Palestinian household. So, okay. Decenter your mind from, you know... a, a 21st century, three-bedroom, nuclear family house, and visualise a house with something like 20 or 30 rooms, in house. which... Sorry? It's a share house. It's a share house. A very, very big share house that has space for the elders of the family, all the kids and their kids, the various hangers-on and friends of the family that don't have anywhere to be at the moment or are visiting from out of town for an indeterminate period, and people would come and visit for months because it took ages to travel anywhere the various servants and slaves and various other people that are around who are all part of the household and who are all considered part of the family and who all have to be cared for. So it's an open and inclusive sense of what a household can be. Not a rigid, strict, authoritarian, hierarchical structure of household with the father at the head telling everybody else what to do. So, to summarise, um, while gender is inherent in flesh and the story of the Gospel of John is of a, of a flesh and blood human being called Jesus, who we know as the Christ. Uh, therefore, in describing a family relationship with God, you have to use a gendered term. There's no alternative. So he refers to God as Father. But the sense of that relationship transcends the symbol of Father. It stretches the mind out into a more, a deeper, more mutual, more intimate, transcendent relationship. So then what is my father's house? In the beginning of the gospel, it's pretty thorough. His father's house is the temple in Jerusalem. And then during that, that period where there's the kind of, from the overturning part to the various replacements that happen during the Feast of Tabernacles, from verse 7 onwards, to then the final, there's a, a series of final disputes after which it said, Jesus leaves the temple and doesn't come back. He leaves the temple, goes east and crosses the Jordan. Um, and that's it, really. And from that point, when he says, my father's house, he's referring to the, the sense of house moves from a building, which is a house, and the term in Greek, oikos, um, always means the building, but it also means the household, in the sense of, you know, the house of Tudor, right? It's not a building, it's, a, it's an inclusive sense of a whole household. So crucially, in, in John 14, he says, in my father's house there are many, many dwellings, I go to prepare a place for you. There's a whole digression on what preparing a place means all the way through the Hebrew scriptures, and it's always used in, in reference to um, in reference to a, a holy place or a temple or the tabernacle. Um, what does he mean when he says, "In my Father's house there are many dwellings"? Now, classically, that's always in Catholic tradition. That's usually taken to mean. He's saying, I'm going off to heaven where everything is pretty and there are many pretty rooms and I'll prepare pretty rooms for you so that when you die and you come to heaven with me and we live with my father in his beautiful house, you'll have a pretty room to live in. I'm being a bit dismissive. 
But that would be odd if he was saying that, because all through the Gospel of John, when Jesus refers to eternal life, he's always talking about here and now. He's not talking about some life lived in heaven after death. That's characteristic of how he talks about he talks about an afterlife in the synoptics, but he really doesn't talk about he talk, briefly refers to resurrection at the end of time, at the final days in the Gospel of John. But the phrase eternal life, or as Dr. Collar translates it, eternity life, aeon on zoon, the life in the aeons, if you like. <laughs> eternity life is a different mode of life lived right now. So it would be odd if he's talking about what's going to happen to us when we go to God's pretty house in heaven. All through the Gospel of John, I could be preempting something that I'm supposed to talk about later. I'll just say it now, and then if I have to sit there, I'll just come back later. Dwelling. Meno is the verb in Greek. What does it mean to, to what does it mean when he says there are many dwellings or many dwelling places? Every time that verb meno is used in the fourth gospel, it's always about God dwelling. The Holy Spirit dwells here. God dwells here. The Father dwells here. God's always doing the dwelling. So at a first read of that, he seems to be saying, in my Father's house there are many dwellings for you. But actually when you look at how that verb is used rigorously through the whole gospel, and it's never used in another sense, it's really unlikely that's what he's saying. What he's saying in, is, in my Father's house there are many dwellings for God. I go to prepare a place for you. In the house in which God can dwell. What on earth could this mean? Okay. I, <laughs> I've sort of erred in the, on the side of um, putting a lot of the evidentiary material in because I, I've sort of thought just to kind of say, so here's the summation of what Mary Cole is saying, kind of presents you with something for which there's no kind of ground or evidence, but I'm starting to feel like the evidence is taking more long than the point I really want to make. But, just quickly, the image of the household. So, the image of the temple is sown all the way through the gospel up until the crucifixion, and the image of the household begins at, you know, earlier than the image of the temple, and the two images run side by side through the whole gospel. It's not that there's temple and then household. The, the household's being prepared at the same time as the temple's being, um, the overthrow of the temple is being predicted, accomplished and completed. So that the household is kind of like fully baked by the time the temple has been finally overturned. Because the question, the great question, right? Christ is on the cross, he hands over his spirit, okay, then what? <laughs> we've, we've overturned the, the acceptable rites, cultic rites of the temple, the correct, we've established through the course of the gospel that the correct place to worship God isn't the temple in Jerusalem, it's hanging with Jesus. Don't hang out at the temple, hang with me, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's not John, I don't think, but still. Or is it? Is it? It is, it's an I am statement, of course. Um, and, you know, he even makes, just out of consideration, makes a little loop out to Samaria and says, um, not only is it not the temple in Jerusalem, it's also not Mount Gerizim. You guys need to come too, and draws the Samaritans in. Right? So, the whole nation. And eventually talks to the Greeks. And even talks to Pilate, right? So he even talks to the Romans. So it's kind of, all y'all, the correct place to hang out with God, hang with me, okay? Everybody following? Oh, I'm dead. Now what happens? So as his eminence was saying before, the Gospel's talking not just to what happened, it's also talking to the distress of the community in the wake of what goes on. He's left us. We're on our own. He was the great teacher. He was telling us what to do. He was providing us with a new law by which we could live life. Now what do we do? Okay. So the steps. In John, in the Gospel of John, John the Baptist, although he's never referred to as the Baptist, <laughs> in fact, he doesn't even do any baptizing. <laughs> his followers baptize. He doesn't do any actual baptizing. He sort of hangs. Um, he's not a forerunner. He doesn't prepare the way. He makes straight the way in the Gospel of John. Dr. Collow argues that if you look at... Okay, so hang on, just a little bit of, little bit of prep. Um, in first century Palestine, if you're going to have a wedding, the first thing is the bride and groom have to work out who the bride and groom are. Step one, the bridegroom sends usually his dad 
to negotiate with the bride's dad about how this is all going to go down. But the dads can't talk because there's too much face at stake. So you need a buddy. Who we call it.